Hello, everyone. If you're here, would you mind turning your videos on? Because otherwise, Sharon and I are talking to some black boxes, which is always a bit tricky. <laughs> I think everyone is here, so we're going to get started if everyone is ready. Good afternoon. I'm Rowena. I'm from Mediation Institute, and I would like to welcome Lizana and Sharon from the Co-Parenting Institute to chat to you today about the high managing high-conflict personalities. So over to you both. Hi. Thank you so uh, much for joining us today, everyone. Lizanne and I started the Co-Parenting Institute last year. I'm a psychologist who's been working in Western Australia for 33 years, largely in the family court space as a court-appointed family therapist and child therapist usually. And Lizanne Eriks is a mediator who's worked for a long time in Western Australia too with high-conflict families. So today we were wanting to talk to you about dealing with high conflict people, as I'm sure it's something you all deal with on a daily, if not hourly basis. And there's lots of different reasons that people can be high conflict. First of all, Sharon, if that's okay before we start, there are some people are messaging that I don't have video. If you have questions, if you're not on video or you're driving or whatever it is that you're doing, if you have questions, just put them in the box. Sharon and I are more than happy for you guys to pipe up throughout this session. We were talking about it before we started. We both find it a bit, we're just talking at you. It's, it's not as dynamic as we like it. So if you have a question about anything we're saying, please let us know. And we also will talk a little bit about how you can support people after the mediation process, because as we all know, and I, I, you guys will all know this, it's such a short process and we're supposed to transform everything in, in a mediation session. And, and so that's quite uh, difficult. So what can you do to support clients? So they are um, also set up to win when they, they leave the mediation process. I will get the slides up for you, Sharon, so you can. Okay. So well, I wanted to talk a bit about what actually is high conflict when we're, we all have our own ideas of what high conflict is or isn't. I think anybody's capable of high conflict behaviour at some time. For most of us, that will be because we don't feel in control of events or we've suffered a disappointment or we're unwell. And these occurrences are usually pretty uncommon and afterwards we feel a lot of regret and remorse and tend to apologise and try to mend our bridges. Often people in the first 12 months after separation, I find even people who are generally quite reasonable people can be quite high conflict and their emotions are dysregulated and they can behave in uncharacteristically high conflict manner. But the people I'm really wanting to talk to today are the people who talk about today what I think of a true high conflict personality, which people who are born with a greater predisposition to high conflict behaviour. And it often leads to other people seeing them as difficult or hard to deal with, hard to get on with. This is a strategy that some people have learned growing up in dysfunctional homes and it's got them what they needed to get by and they've never learned more functional ways to engage with other people. And other people, it might be a sign of an underlying mental illness. So it could be a personality disorder or something of that that just leads them to have a propensity for their emotions to get out of control and for them to want to blame other people and seek validation through that. So people with high conflict personality traits are characterised by being rigid and uncompromising thinking and actions an inability to accept or heal from loss. So they can't let things go. They hang on to things from the past a lot longer than the average person. They have negative emotions that dominate their thinking, an inability to reflect on their own behaviour, difficulty empathising with others, and a preoccupation with blaming others. So they have distorted thinking, which was one of the big problems with high-conflict behaviour people, and they don't have clear logical reasoning. They tend to be really driven by strong emotion and, and can't stand back and look at that from an external point of view. They have really unregulated emotions. They just can't keep themselves in check. So they fall into a pattern of toxic behaviour, usually where they're aggressive, controlling, intimidating. They like to blame and shame people. And I'm sure you've all experienced that mediation where you're like, wow, that escalated really quickly. I thought we had things in hand and all of a sudden we're going back to the past, blaming, shaming, bringing up highly emotive topics that aren't necessarily useful for you in getting to resolve the issues that are on the table at mediation that day. So one of the things that I find useful when dealing with high conflict people in these situations is EAR or ear statements, which is basically stands for empathy, attention and respect. 
So empathy involves giving high conflict personalities or any upset person a statement showing that you have empathy for them. So it could be something like, I can see your frustration and I want to help you. This must be really difficult for you. It's a tough day. Anything at all that just makes you build a little link and shows that you recognise them as a human. Attention. Pay attention to their concerns. Tell me more so that I can understand your problem. Something just that make, makes you feel like you makes them feel like you're focusing on them so that they feel a little bit of a connection with you. And respect. Give the person your respect. Say something like, I can see how hard you've worked to solve this problem. By saying these types of EAR statements, you tend to calm people down and help them feel a bit of a connection to you in a non-threatening manner so that you can focus on the problem solving. Because the last thing we want is for those emotions that we were talking about earlier and the blaming, the shaming, the high levels of aggression. It's not going to be helpful to you in mediation. So anything we can do to just follow the EAR and keep them nice and calm and feeling connected and respected is likely to lead to them to have, having less outbursts that are going to slow down the process. The second thing that I like to do after you've made that connection with the person is to analyse your options by helping them look at the choices. For example, if you're dealing with property matters, you might want to make a list of options. If you're dealing with a high conflict personality, you can briefly tell him or her something like, that situation sounds frustrating. Now let's look at your choices. And this keeps you from getting stuck in his or her complaints about the past and also helps you to avoid becoming responsible for solving his or her problem because you never want to do that. It is their problem. You're just there to help the mediator, obviously. You just want to assist with solving the problem, not actually be the one to come up with the answers. So I think getting down all of their options and helping them to clear the clutter out of their highly emotional brain that at that moment is finding it really hard to regulate those things, getting a list will help them to assist them to do that and keep focused on the task at, task at hand. High conflict personalities are often evident before you've even met them because of the tone of their emails or any communication with you. They're like that really pretty vicious on social media or emails and they tend to seriously distort information even though they actually usually don't realise that they're doing that. So they think that they're just giving a fair email or a fair bit of feedback when actually most people would look at it and go, wow, that's really hostile and out of line. So rather than getting into arguments with them about their distortions and hostility, it just helps to give them a response as a biff response, just be brief, informative, friendly and firm and try to move along because if you could get bogged down forever and ever trying to justify their, letting them justify their distorted view on what the information is or just going back to the past over and over again, but it's actually not moving you forward and it's not helpful to anybody in the room. I think just use a BIF response, brief, informative, friendly, firm, and try to keep it moving along. Straight, accurate information without defensiveness, emotions, opinions, or counterattack. The other thing that we all know we need to do with high conflict behaviour is to set limits on them. So in many cases, setting limits is the most important and the most difficult step in handling high conflict people. High conflict personalities generally have less self-control and they're more impulsive and they're less aware of the impact of their behaviours on others. They often don't care if their behaviour bothers or hurts anyone else or even themselves. They can be quite self-injurious without even appearing to care. They'll just take high-risk behaviours in the things that they say or do. What helps to tell them that there's an external reason there that requires them to behave in a certain way. For example, you could say something like, our organisation has a policy that forbids me to fulfil that request or Australian family law requires us to follow this process because this avoids making it personal. A high conflict personality is always going to try to make it personal and they're going to try to shame and blame and bring it back to the past. So it's really important that we keep trying to focus on the issue and don't let it get personal. Like You have to control, make sure they're not pushing your triggers so that you start engaging in the personal stuff. High conflict personalities tend to take a lot personally and then they want to get revenge. So it helps to set limits by saying what you yourself can and can't do. So if you can't reach agreement, say something like, if you can't reach agreement on this issue, I'm not going to be able to write up a parenting plan with you today. You can't control a high conflict personality, but you can control your responses to the high conflict personality and possibly some consequences for them. I think it must be remembered that when you set these consequences, do them with attention, 
empathy and respect statements. Dealing with high conflict people can be hard and it helps to have a whole toolbox of techniques. These are just one of them. I'm sure you guys already are experienced mediators. You'd have lots of things in your toolbox. So today I was just wanting to add another tool in there that might help to give you some perspective on it. Some things that people tell me that particularly people in, in mediation or family court collaborative roles and things where they're put on the spot of doing their negotiations, some people tell me that it takes helps to centre themselves on something when they feel that they're getting dragged into the personal stuff or they're actually starting to be affected by all of the nastiness and, and toxic behaviour that's in the room that one colleague told me that she thinks focus on my feet and she just focuses on her feet and wriggles her toes a bit. So people can, and, and that, that just centers her to remind, okay, I'm here in the room, I can wriggle my toes, breathe and go back to taking charge and dealing with this person how I want to deal with them rather than being roped in and having my behavior changed by how they're interacting with me. So I think something to really avoid too in my experience with high conflict personalities is trying to give them any insight into themselves. Even in therapy, they tend to really dislike that like people will really arc them up trigger defensiveness and it I guess it feeds into that trap that a lot of personality disorders and people with high conflict personalities they feel like you don't like them and they're dislikable and they're looking for evidence to support that so as soon as you try to give them some feedback or insight into their behavior obviously as a therapist you have to but in a mediation it's probably just going to slow your process because you'll trigger their defensiveness and they'll get angry with you and start the blaming and shaming I think the other main thing that I would find it, from my experience is to avoid putting any focus on the past, just focus as much as you can on the future and keep leading people back to that, like cutting them off firmly and fairly and focusing on the future because the tendency for most high conflict personalities is to get stuck on the past and on the blaming and the indication of why they've behaved like they are and why they're the, the wronged party and the victim does that make sense? Questions? I believe to ask Sharon lots of questions. She's actually brilliant at this because as mediators, right, we are we're dealing with high conflict people, but I don't think in the extent that Sharon normally does because she's in court, like assessing families and things like that. I, I think as mediators, we have very high conflict people, but not to the extent as well of working with Sharon because we both come from such a different angle. So if you have any questions about that, is anyone I can't you just unmute yourself if you want to ask Sharon anything. Um, Dee, I see you're putting your hand yeah, up. Hi. Yeah, hi, guys. Thank you. Been hi, really you. looking forward to, to this session today because the nature of what we do is high conflict anyway. And then when you say, what is it on the scale of one to 10, it can be awfully difficult. And I agree with you in that, that centering space, which is to focus on like your feet or whatever it is. And sometimes in those situations, I really embrace that concept of curiosity so it helps me disengage from automatically going on my own defensiveness, which we all do. If somebody's attacking us, mm -hmm. it is human nature to go, but no, that's not true. Stop talking to me like that. So the way that I've celebrated that process is to be perpetually curious as to it's almost, I wonder what it is that's triggering that person to be in that state and to behave in that way. And I know you've got to slow everything down and do that. So Apart from those types of processes, is there anything else that you have found that's a really good way to de-escalate that stressful situation? Sometimes taking a break, I find with, so, so I obviously, I don't do mediations, but I do things like reunification therapies and family therapies that can get really heated. Generally, I, I was just saying to Rowan before this session started, my clientele, I've, I've not done the statistics on it, but I would guess that they'd be in the top couple of percent of cases in the family court. Most people settle before trial and the cases that I get at trial are all the ones where there, there's allegations of drug abuse or sex abuse, emotional abuse, parental alienation. So they're pretty high conflict by nature. I sometimes find my office is designed, I find that thinking of your office setup or where you're working to with high conflict can actually have good implications. I like my office set up to have three doors, so it's, which makes it hard when you're finding office space, but because I'll have, say, if it's family therapy and it's highly conflictual, I'll have mum arrive and fifth through one door and 15 minutes later dad arrive through another door. And then if they, people need a break, they can leave through the other door and just signal to me time out, and I'll, but, but they're not allowed to leave the process and I'll disengage and come and down and get them to come back in. You might not all have the luxury of the three doors, but I think staggering it, 
having a bit of space and just saying to people at the outset, look, sometimes this can be really emotional and you might start feeling like your head's spinning or you just need a little break for a while. That's okay. Take a break, but we don't want you storming out and leaving the mediation because that's, I don't know if you guys find that's a problem, but that's what I have to set limits on in family therapy because you get somebody who gets so emotional, then they storm out the door and leave from the car park. And then that's not at all helpful. It takes weeks to reschedule to get everybody back. So we set the, I set the ground rules that you can't leave. We're here for it. But I understand if you need a break, either one of you can go out either door, and but you have to stay there and then I'll come talk to you and we'll work out a way to get you feeling okay back in the room again. You know, be a little, you can't say to people they have to stay, but you definitely would. Um, yeah, say don't I say the kinds of don't storm off. Yeah, you can have a break. Yes, mine's cool to it, so I can tell them. <laughs> don't yeah, don't go away, but I can't say Yeah, because it's voluntary, isn't it? We have not got to remind them. Yeah, it's a voluntary process. But it's interesting, that's where ego sometimes comes into play too, which is I'm not going to storm out because I don't want to be seen to be the one that's giving up. So so you can actually use that in in a sort of in a constructive way because at the end of the day we understand that conflict always invokes that sense of I'm going to win. And what we're trying to do as mediators is have it so that everybody walks away with a resolve, but maybe utilising that sort of as a way of, of hopefully keeping them stayed in. But you just never know what to expect. I had a mediation last week and there was absolutely no way we thought that the gentleman was going to turn up. He turned up. Not only did he turn up, mm-hmm. but he actually gave in more than what we all anticipated. And there was a lot of work in the pre-mediation stage to get an understanding of where each parties were actually at. And there was, if you went to the TAB and you put a bet on it, you would have said he wouldn't have turned up and you wouldn't have had a solution. And it happened. So sometimes you just don't know. No, you don't. No, you don't. I mean, I think you've got to try to keep them in control of their emotions and keep in control of your own too because it is, it's, especially sometimes you get these really high conflict cases and it's at the end of the day, at the end of a bad week and you've got your own stuff going on in your personal life and then you get somebody coming and shouting in your face. So it, we're all human and it's but it's just not helpful to us if we shout back. Or, so it's just getting yourself in the right frame of mind before you go into it and having a few strategies. But I've re- really found, like, I deal particularly, I guess I've had a lot of very highly conflictual men and men with who are very volatile and perhaps spent time in, in prison and things, and that's why we're trying to reunify them with kids. I've always found the quickest way to calm people down and keep it calm is be really super polite and super respectful to just... I often think to myself, I've got six adult children and I often think how vulnerable people are when they come to us. And I would hope that if any of my six kids are ever in the situation where they're dealing with a professional like ourselves, that somebody would treat them, remember that even though they might be acting like a bit of a jerk that day, that there might be a lot of reasons for that and to just treat them with kindness and respect. And often people, you talk them off the ledge, they come in really angry but when you just keep being unfailingly polite respectful but firm you don't have to be going like oh I'm so sorry for things that aren't your fault but just being really respectful of them as a human on the same level as you yeah yeah absolutely and and one of the other things is obviously as mediators we, we want to stay calm and logical and, and Sharon was saying before it's not strange that you get triggered yourself as a human being but what you don't want to do is to start reacting to the client. And um, I, I mentor a lot of mediators and sometimes when we're mentoring, I'm like, you're actually getting in an argument with your client about, you know what I mean, if they should this or that. I had a really high conflict. It was actually before Christmas. And the in this case, a gender one, women can also be high conflict, so please don't see it as a gender. But he started off with saying how terrible my office was and how terrible my assistant was. And he just wanted to get in an argument with me. In those situations, I choose to, to say thank you for the feedback. I'll, I'll reflect on that later. Can we get... Because if I would go and have a conversation about him, how I disagree about my assistant, I know my assistant is great, so I don't have to worry about that. It's going to derail the entire conversation and we're not there for that. So... In my personal life, I probably might have a different conversation with someone. But at that point, I think it's choosing as a mediator to go, what are the, picking your battles? What are the things that you actually are useful to deal with? I don't really care how he feels about my office, to be fairly quite frank. Um, I know it's fine. So it's just to go, okay, thank you for letting me know. I'll see if I can make some adjustments to that. Or maybe I can't and let's move on, right? I, I think using a friendly tone of voice is really important. And sometimes it's easier said than done, particularly if you're getting heightened yourself, because we all know that what tone of voice you use really can evoke different responses in people. If you say, 
hey, what are you doing here? Then I sound really curious. But if I say, hey, what are you doing here? It's the same thing. So you're saying the same thing, right? But it sounds like you're telling someone off or whatever. So be really mindful of your tone of voice and the way you speak to people. And particularly high conflict people, they don't like to be told off or told what to do. So make sure you keep your voice really calm. And this is really tricky because Cheryl is already talking about this avoiding, like moving towards the future. So I, I have different thoughts on that. Not that I, I agree, you have to move these people to the future. And as mediators, we, in all the courses, I teach most of these courses about, if, don't talk about the past, talk about the future. And I think it is important, particularly with high conflict people, but I don't think it's always appropriate when you're in mediation because sometimes People really need to talk about the past a little bit. There's so much research out there as well. If you just say to people, you can't talk about the past, that's it. And you don't let anyone speak or feel that they have a voice in the session that can really backfire as well. But if they're really high conflict, sometimes you just can't do it because then all you do is talk about the past. So I think as a mediator, you have to make an assessment about where, and often with those people, I just let them vent a lot in the intake and let me tell them everything. So they know I've heard it. They know I know about it. They know I've got it. So then they don't have to do it as much in a session. And some of them you really have to contain, particularly if there's been domestic violence and things like that. But I also find sometimes if you want to squash it too much, they're only going to get louder. So it's about how to, whatever person you have in front, front of them. But they, what you don't want them to do is to constantly say how bad the other person was and why and, and constantly keep nagging at the other parent because obviously they've experienced that for a very long time in the marriage probably so we don't want clients that mediation to be a platform for high conflict personality to do a bit more damage right so this is really i think your call about how you're going to go about it some high conflict people you really just sometimes it will be a shuttle right but you really can talk about okay i get what you're saying however how is this going to help you I also often find people with some personality disorders possibly i'm not i can't diagnose but sometimes you can tell that it, there's mental health issues there and it's really also making it about them. How is this going to help you? I know you don't like the other parent and you don't want to do them any favors, but how is it going to help you to get agreement? How is it going to help your child? How is it going to be something? Because when they feel it's that becoming something that is in their interests, then they're much more interested in. Sometimes for some people, you just have to make sure that it's their idea, even though it also works for the client. Because as a mediator, I know what the other person is wanting. I know from the intake where the other person wants to go. So sometimes you can do it in a way and it's and without manipulation because it almost sounds like you're manipulating someone but to go, this can really be their idea by asking the right questions. So then they feel really empowered. It's their idea. They're in control. But in the end of the day, it works for everyone. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah? yeah. Okay, great. Don't give advice. We're not allowed as mediators anyway, but people do try to get us to do that. So be really careful, particularly when people start talking about my kid is this age, what do you recommend? Like all those sort of things. I know some mediators do that. I think you have to be very careful because from my perspective, also when people are really smart, they start pulling research from everywhere. Uh, and I often find if you have an opinion, if you look hard enough, there's some research you can find that will underpin it. So just, just to be careful with saying this is what I think young kids or these kids should do or not do. Or I think it's really for the parents to work that out. It doesn't mean you can't talk about we have the best interest of the child, but the best interest of the child. There, there are lots of situations where we feel we, we you can tell it's not in the best interest of children. It's really clear. But I often also feel that the best interest of the child gets bounced around a lot in sessions while it's just someone's opinion they just sugarcoat it with this is in the best interest of the children and I often say from your point of view you know what I mean so that's what you think is in the best interest of the child because often parents have a very different view of what's in the best interest of their children so also be careful to not let people run with that but if you give unsolicited advice to a high conflict personality that is not going to go very well because they don't want to hear it they didn't ask for it and I definitely don't want you to do that and particularly not in front of the other parents so be very careful Avoiding apologies. So difficult people can blame you for their situation and it's all your fault and you did something wrong. And sometimes I've had a couple of clients that are really just trying to look for anything and anything that you could have done wrong, right? So this guy who came in, I actually squeezed these people in the afternoon before Christmas because I really wanted to help them. It was really escalating and I was actually already supposed to have time off. So I did them so many favors. It was not funny. And he was relentless, right? Because he wanted, he was just a high person, high person. I can't speak today. High conflict personality. 
And at one point I had to just stop the communication. So I was like, I'm on holidays now. And, and it was actually the best thing because he can go and calm down. He, he accused me of all sorts, like that I was, I altered the agreement and all these things. I have no interest in doing that. I would never do that. But it was really in his mind, he was so looking for to blame someone. Be with those people, make sure you walk really on the tightrope, make sure you do everything by the book. And not that you normally wouldn't do everything by the book, but you know what I'm saying? I'm normally hyper vigilant and going, okay, if they're going to make a complaint about me, am I, can I answer all these questions? Have I ticked all the boxes? Just to make sure that there's none of that blame can come to you. And also to be really solid within yourself, your processes, you know what you do. I'm always happy to take feedback from clients and I'm always happy to reflect, but from some people, I'm like, I'm not taking that feedback and that's okay. I'm not telling them, but you don't have to get in a knot about it. If you know you've done a good job, make sure you have your own supervision or whatever about it because those people can be really impactful and you get an email like that and you're like, wow, I really, and it can feel personal. It's like I tried to accommodate you more than anyone else and and now it's backfiring on me regardless. You know what I mean? So make sure you, you do your processes, but also stop the communication. I had, had a, I had a high conflict client call me at one point. We did a mediation and it all got resolved. But he was someone that, in this case, was a he. Like I said, there's also women who are high conflict, so don't get me wrong. And he called me and was starting to complain about the way I've written the agreement. So one of my processes is that I write the agreements in the session with the clients. So one reason is to avoid this kind of stuff, right? So I said to him, no, thank you again for your feedback. He was saying it in a horrible way. So what he wanted was for me to respond and to get in an argument with him. I said, thank you so much for your feedback. I will um, you know, take into consideration for other sessions that I have in the future. And then I was just quiet. And I could see, hear him almost on the other side of the phone going, what's happening? Because <laughs> he wanted an argument and I didn't give it to him. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said to him, you have not requested anything of me. So do you have a request? What is it that you would like me to do? I said, I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I haven't heard anything. And he didn't know. He actually didn't have a request. All he wanted to do is argue. So I said to him, well, why don't you go away and think about a request? And if you have one, let me know. And then we can go from there. And it doesn't mean I'll set. I'm not promising you that I will, you know, do what you asked me to do, but I can always think about it. And he never came back to me and he referred lots of people to me. It was very weird. So I think it's also put, keep putting it back on them and not trying to, that was one of those moments I was like, that was really great because I didn't get dragged into his argument, I was like, I was also happy for him to give me the feedback and I was happy to hear what he wanted me to do, but he didn't even know. Does it make sense? So be friendly, but have firm boundaries. You know what your process is, you know what you do, you know what you don't do. As people, you guys know all this, as people were trying to make you change the process or not talk to the other parent and they will disorganize it or whatever it all is. And you just have to go, I won't be doing this. I will not be doing that. And what Sharon said before works really well. You can say, this is my process or under the law. or So it has nothing to do with them because one of the things that high conflict personalities do try to, to get you to do is because they threaten people is for you to start bending to them. And that's when you really get yourself in a hole because all of a sudden you're off process. I've done it in the past. So I can be honest about that. When I started practicing, I, I did fell in that hole at times and I didn't do that anymore, but it was really like, you get someone freaked you out and you're like, okay, let's just see how, how different we can do to keep this person happy. And, and it just doesn't work. So don't have them control your process or the way you practice because it's not going to work. Okay. So in general, you obviously, when you want to de-escalate when it's in the room, I'm just going to have to minimize this because I actually can't see my notes. So make sure they get good advice before coming to mediation. Legal advice is really important, particularly when someone is really unreasonable and is wanting something that they're never going to get in court, fairly or unfairly. Sometimes people want things that might be reasonable, but the court might not agree with them. And that's one of the other ways to really be able to talk to those people and say, listen, what did your lawyer say? Or if the lawyers are there, obviously they can advise them. And also, what is it, the button and the what now, what we all know, what is it going, how long is it going to take to get you to court? What is it? So often you can have stepped approaches, for example, with child having children see their parents, not maybe 50-50 in one go, but stepped approach or they feel they're making progress, but it's not all in one go. So that's a really good way as a mediator to go, what do you want to do? Some people just want to fight and want to go to court and they, they that's their prerogative clearly, but these are really good conversations to have with high conflict personalities and saying, listen, it's not, you don't have to do this, but have a think about it. And is this a, a good idea for you or not? And creating, going through all the options with them and letting them choose. Like we do with anyone really, but I think it's a particularly 
really important with high conflict personalities. And people use generalizing language. And that's something that not only high conflict personalities do, I sometimes do it with my husband. You always, you never, right? So it's something you really want to talk to your clients about. So you always do this. You never do this. Everyone, ev anybody, like these are all very generalizing, generalizing language. And it just is not true. No one never puts a cup in a dishwasher. Or no one always is abusive. Or there's lots of times. I haven't met my eldest son. Well, he doesn't put a cup in a dishwasher ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, besides your children. No, no, but and but when you use generalizing language, it evokes conflict. If someone does it to me, and I know what response, I don't know about you guys, but do who feels when someone says, you always do this, do you feel like you want to respond and go, no, I don't. Like, what are you talking about? So actually when clients use that language, I say in inject sessions, is that always the case, really? Can you ever think about that? And coach clients around trying not to use that kind of language in mediation. I say to my parents I work with, if you start using always and never and just take, take that out of your vocabulary, you'll have a lot less conflict in your life. So challenge the clients on that and that makes a difference. Obviously, these are the things that you guys already know about. You listen to both parties' concerns and validate their concerns. And they don't have to agree, but we want them to at least get an understanding of why someone is feeling that way. And that's sometimes where the past does come into the conversation a little bit, but you're going to have to contain it if someone is just there to sprout and sprout. And then you might want to give them some warning about that in your opening statement or in the intake session to say, hey, listen, I can't let you, you know, we did this today in the intake. I can't let you go into it in that much depth because it just derails the situation. And if someone said, yeah, but because he's going to, I'll say, how is he going to respond to that? Or how is she going to respond to that? Yeah, he or she's very unreasonable and won't listen and won't make a difference. So then you can work with that. So if you that's what you're telling me, then it's not going to get you from A to B. So let's not do that. So again, you make it about the benefit for them and then they might be able to do it. And of course, and this is what Sharon and I, why we started the Co-Parenting Institute in general is educate parents about the impact of conflict on children. I'm quite, I can be quite brutal about it. I'm really nice about it, but I'm also not going to beat around the bush around it. Clients tell me all the time, the kids have to see psychologists and do this and that. And I often say, if you guys would work it out, then maybe they don't need to. I don't say it in that way in a bit more, obviously the nicer way, but I think it's more, Sharon always says, if clients do better, if clients know better, they do better. So that's part of why we have the courses that we're going to talk to you about you shortly. But it's really important. A lot of people actually don't know. So I always think that no one is a horrible parent. All the people that come to me, even if they are feeling really upset or they seem unreasonable or high conflict, people love their kids. So it's, and they often, they forget that they're on the same team. So I think a part of our job is to really focus on that. And what can they put in place to have less conflict or no conflict? Because conflict is it's just horrible. You go to bed with it, you get up with it, it's impactful in your entire life. The other thing that's really great, and we also talk about this in our turning point course, which we're going to talk about in a second, but is educate parents that they can do something about the conflict on their own. Often we have one client that has high conflict and the other client's not. And they are just tearing their hair out and going, I don't want conflict but I feel I can't make a difference because the other parent will not uh, cooperate in any way, shape or form. It's also about educating clients around that they can actually make a difference through their conflict on their own. And that's a really difficult concept. And I don't know if in mediation, we always have enough time to really work with other clients. You can, I, I always do my best, but obviously it depends how many sessions you have with people to be able to actually, I, I think it takes a little bit more than that sometimes. And again, that's why we have a program where we teach people this to go, how can you make a difference in that conflict, even when another parent is the way that is? You're not going to change another parent. You can keep blaming them and, and you get stuck or you're actually going to look at what, what you can do about it and how you can respond to it. So I think that's a really powerful thing as well. And it empowers people to go, oh my gosh, I can actually make a difference. I don't have to live with this the rest of my life. And the other thing is that I do a lot is when parents want the other parent to do something, I talk to them about, are you willing to do it as well? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. And sometimes it's not right. Sometimes one parent needs more education or has drug and alcohol problems and the other person has not. I get all that. But as a general thing, I think what's wrong with both doing a parenting course? If it makes the other parent feel better and they do it and you always learn something when you do something anyway, um, you know, it might. It, it, I think it really helps with making agreements, particularly when you're dealing with a high conflict personality. They feel attacked. They feel it's all about them. But if the other parent goes, listen, I'm going to do this too. So we both do it. I think that often really takes the sting out of it and makes people go, oh yeah, if you're doing it too, then I don't mind doing it. Because then you take that whole winning power. I have one over you 
um, situation out of it. I'm just trying to look at, is there any questions in there? Okay. Can I ask if you think parental alienation is from Belinda? Is a strategy how conflict personnel is used to maintain control? Or do you think they are separate things? Oh, that's probably one more one for me. I think parental alienation can have many different causes from often people with personality disorders. I, I would think of much more highly um, represented in parental alienation statistics. Um, and it can be a form of coercive control when somebody's partner leaves the relationship. Uh, I guess it's the other extreme is if I can't have them, you can't where people commit familicides. Um, another way of controlling your partner is to take charge of the children and make sure that they don't see them. I probably a great percentage of my work is dealing with parental alienation and it's really sad because our lead times in the family court in Western Australia are so long that often if it's a three-year gap between when you initiate court proceedings and when you get heard in court, then the alienators had a big chunk of time to uh, work on your child while they're not seeing you. But, yeah, I, I think that it's not always personality disorder-based. Control would certainly have a, a big issue in there. Right. Yeah, Melinda, I don't know if that answers your question, but otherwise, please um, speak up. Okay, so obviously, is there any other questions about the high-conflict personalities? Anyone? I can't say you. There's too many boxes, so I just want to make sure I... No, I don't think so. I'll just keep going. Just let me know. Belinda, did that answer your question? Because I can see you. Yes, it did. It was um, very helpful. I think we see so much of it in mediation, parental alienation. It's hard to know if it's something that you can actually work with as well. If it's coming, but if it's coming from a place of coercive control, it's something that is beyond what we can manage in mediation. I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And again, I, don't, I don't know the the figures on it, but I would assume that people probably start in mediation with parental alienation issues, and then it would quickly escalate to the courts. Would that be right? Because I guess yeah. those degrees yeah. of safety issues and things probably pr pretty quickly rear their head. Because I'm never involved at the mediation end or anywhere in the beginning. I'm usually at the arse end yeah. where I get involved in it. But yeah, I, I think parental alienation is such a complex issue, and it's becoming. Uh, it, there's like all little underground support groups on social media where they swap information and it's quite organised. So it's quite concerning. I think it comes from many different areas and some of them I think are just sometimes women might genuinely feel that their ex isn't capable of looking after their children. So it comes from a position of fear where initially where they're like, I have to prove he can't have them on their own, how to cope. And then it just, the, the, the narrative gets so entrenched that they start to believe it even more. So I don't think there's any one cause but it's an absolutely devastating thing to happen for children mm. and the alienated mm. parent and extended family. Yeah. And it's one of the topics in, so we, again, I keep referring to this great course, but it's not, it's a, a course we have developed under the Co-Parenting Institute together. It's one of the weeks there is about to let go when they're with someone else and to, and it, it doesn't address parental alienation as such, but what it does address is the anxiety that kinds that people cause when they give big lists or they tell the kids that dad can't give me my medication or I can't make lunches or mum, whatever. So it, it's all about the impact that has on the children. And so hopefully again, and Sharon will tell stories about the kids that she sees and the things they say about that. And, and some kids are fearful of something that has never happened. And they don't even know that, Sharon, you probably should tell the story. But we've we obviously been teaching for a little while together. So I know I'll share and share lots of this, her stories. She stopped telling my stories. Uh, but, but it's really but it's really great to also. So we, we do deal with, again, not a parental alienation, but we do deal with those kind of things and the impact on kids on being able to. And also how nice it is for yourself if you can let go and you actually have a, even though you find it hard, have a great weekend without children, right? And after going, just going back to this topic, how to support clients after mediation, you'd obviously be aware you can get referrals to a psychologist through mental health plans from your GP. And then there's probably in your areas, depending on where you are, Relationships Australia and different um, government agencies that you may be able to get some support from. Often the wait lists are really untenable, but it depends from area to area. There's obviously private psychologists and things too costs may be a factor there and often finding somebody who's prepared to take something on if it is in the family court so if your clients are already going down the family court if it's left mediation so if where you left them and you want to support them after mediation is mediation failed and they're going to apply to the family court 
then it's hard to get psychologists to support them too because a lot of psychologists just will not work with anybody in the family court because of the high risk of APRA complaints. It's like a highly litigious area. You might not ever get an APRA complaint if you don't work in family court. If you get working family court, they come in pretty fast and thick because all they have to do is say, Sharon Green wrote a report that favoured my ex-wife in the family court and that's it. They don't have to give any other evidence or anything and then it unleashes about a year-long inquiry. So I do totally get why lots of psychs say Bali is not touching it. But Lizanne and I decided that there's this big gap in the market and which is why we developed the Turning Point course, which is for divorced or separated parents with children. And basically we wanted, we were really aware that these people are so vulnerable in that first year, particularly after separation. And so we wanted to give them uh, some self-care because a lot of the time people can't get into therapy, either they can't afford it or there's just no practitioners. It's not, a, it's not an alternative to therapy as in a therapy substitute. It's definitely not therapy, but it's the types of things that I would be teaching clients in those initial sessions and teaching and checking in with them for. The rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, alcohol and drug use, all of those things are sky high in people in that newly separated subset of the population. So we really focus on self-care and do a thorough assessment with them of what areas of their life are working and that what they're happy with and what they need to change. And that's probably the first session is really focusing on them and getting them to understand that self-care is not um, a luxury, it's not being selfish, that no child will cope if their parent's not coping. And in 33 years of professional practice, I've never had a co child cope better than their parents. If the parent isn't coping well in life, the child will also not be coping well in life. So it's really important to emphasise to parents to get their own lives back on track. We also talk, teach them a lot about perception and how it works and how that can be related to how you're going to resolve conflict. And just because you perceive something one way doesn't mean it's a fact or that your ex will perceive it the same way. Uh, we, one of our passions, as Lizanne referred to earlier, is educating people about the impact of conflict on children. And there's numerous psychological studies going back 30, 40 years, peer-reviewed longitudinal studies that prove unequivocally that if we can minimise conflict, either the exposure to conflict, either directly or indirectly for children, we can pretty much mitigate all of the negative factors of divorce and separation. So it's quite empowering, I think, for parents to know that because a lot of people feel like it's out of my control, my ex is being a dick, I can't do anything. But it's actually not. As long as you take steps to minimise the conflict that your kids are exposed to, you can provide really good outcomes for your children. So we talk to them about how to have difficult conversations and we teach them a method called TIPS, which is a, a method of dealing with high conflict, particularly text messages that I've used for many years with my clients. And it's just a very practical strategy to use because over the last probably 15 years, I've noticed a massive increase in the levels of aggression and conflict between separating parties, mainly in my opinion, linked to the advent of instant messaging because in days gone by, you only had snail mail or the landline and by the time you wrote out or a communication book and by the time you wrote it out and then wrote out something while you were absolutely furious, you had time to either go and rip the page out of the communication book or white out over it or not post the letter. But now people have a strong feeling and instantly their thumbs are going and it's off into the ether and, and to the X and then another one's back and the conflict just goes oh, from the sound effect. Yeah, so very technical. So it's just designed to show them what they don't need to respond to, what they do, and if they do need to respond to it, how to do it. We also give them up-to-date information regarding the different methods that are available to them, such as mediation, collaborative practice, uh, applying to the court, and if they apply to the court, exactly what that will entail, because I think people are quite naive. They think that they'll put in an application and three months later we'll be sitting before a judge who will listen to their story and their extra story and make a determination. They don't realise it's going to be years off before you get to that point. Uh, as Lizanne referred to, we talk a lot about letting go of the reins and letting the other parent in their time and rebuilding their life, moving on to a happy future so that they're not just bogged down, focusing on what went wrong in their relationship, that they actually move forward and create a bright future for themselves. So that's a six-week online program. So people get weekly weekly videos and workbooks and people watch them and answer the questions and do the exercises in their own time. And then every week they come online for an interactive 
with uh, Lizanne and myself, where we give them more information and consolidate what they've learned, but also give them the opportunity to ask questions relating to their own personal situation. Did you want to talk about the, oh, well, I should mention where they have to do a quiz and they need to pass the quiz to be able to get a certificate of completion. We've gone to the Family Court in Western Australia and spoken to the judicial officers there and it's we're now getting court orders for parents to complete the course and we're also getting consent orders where solicitors are negotiating with people to, to do the course and use our app, which Lizanne's going to speak to you about in a minute. We've developed an app too. So in Western Australia, it's just, we only launched like a month ago, so it's very new. Mm. But in Western Australia, it's just starting to get some traction and people are starting to understand that there is an option. There's something out there if you can't get individual therapy and there's long wait lists for anything that's um, public. But we actually don't think there's anything like our program out there. It's not strictly a co-parenting course and it's not a conflict resolution course. It's a little bit of everything. It's a little bit of everything. So it's, it's really a both our strengths combined. And like I said, we will still tell people to go and get therapy and, and all those kind of things. But it's really, we've run one now. We actually have one tonight. It's, a, it's And it's designed for busy single parents who have a lot on their plate. So we do it after hours, like they do things in their own time. Uh, and the quizzes are for the resistant client. We are aware that not everyone wants to do this, but if they get court order to do it, we still want them to be engaged as much as possible. We don't know how much, sometimes even when people are in therapy, they might not change if they're not interested but I do think we, if we have lots of people do it then you if we change I don't know 50 or 75 percent of them we don't have numbers yet that's a lot of co-parents who will do a lot better and and for that reason kids will do a lot better um, in, in WA again we have legal aid on board now here as well so we hope that over east we will we'll, we'll, if, if there's anyone here from the eastern states I would love for you to reach out to us because we want to obviously we we don't practice there so we have less connections um, in the east and, and less I guess credibility because in WA everyone knows us but we want to uh, see also bring it and I think that's why we wanted to present it to you guys as mediators because I don't know about you but in my mediations uh, programs and apps are in the agreements like most of the time often so it's really if you have any contacts or anyone that we would love to talk to the court there as well and legal aid here is on board so I'm assuming we will also get legal aid funding over east if we do we maybe we can let you know somehow because so I guess the idea is we want everyone to be able to do it. Uh, so if you have a client that you know for sure that really can't afford it, also feel free to reach out to us. It doesn't mean we give everything away for free, but we really committed to fill this gap to really, I don't know exactly what you guys have available over East, but the, the, the participant who's done it, who've done it so far, all really enthusiastic about it. We just really want to make a difference. So if there's anything that you want us to do, just ask us and we're always happy to consider it. Or if there's anyone you know that you think, oh my God, they should talk to X, Y, Z. Uh, please let us know. So then quickly before we finish, we have an app. We are aware that there's other co-parenting apps out there. However, we did some research on it and we didn't, because we wanted to give the people in the course access to the app because it's part of the course for you people get. And also because we both think that, particularly in very high conflict situations, that an app can really help clients communicate, but it has to be done in a really great way. And it depends on the design of the app. We don't want to discourage communication, but one of the things I really wanted is negotiation through the calendar. So you put a proposal in, the other person can say yes or no. And sometimes that's all it needs. So people say yes, and then you're done. So by sheer numbers of communication, if people communicate less and don't have this elaborate text messages and emails and things coming from all sorts of different places and are confusing, then that itself can really decrease conflict. Of course, there's also clients that do have domestic violence or coercive control or whatever it might be that they're dealing with. And for a lot of people, their phone is a really unsafe place. They're really scared to open their phone up to see if there's anyone that has sent an, an email or text message or phone call. And I get really anxious. Anxiety levels are really high. If people communicate within the app, then obviously the rest of their phone is theirs again. So they can just communicate with their friends and whoever they want and not have to have that constant anxiety. We try to make things just really simple and easy to use. You can track your expenses, there's things that are for child support. So it's just, again, it's just to eliminate conflict between people because if it's in the calendar when everyone has seen the children, you can just roll out the percentages. You don't have to argue about it. You can show it to child support and you're done with it. You know what I mean? We have done because people want this, the particularly for people who alter messages or delete them and things like that. So it can't be altered, can't be deleted. So if it comes to, we don't want people to go to court, but if it comes to that, they can save a lot of legal fees by just pressing the button and everything gets printed out. 
and yeah so, you can sign in so practitioners can yeah. sign in with people's permission and read all the messages and have access to it and one of the things that I've found I'm a great proponent of co-parenting apps one of the reasons why is I think people like if I'm driving along the highway and I notice a police car driving behind me and it's a 60 zone I stick right on 60 even if I'm in hurry when we're being observed we all behave a little bit better even if there's just the possibility of being observed so the fact that it's can't be deleted and you know that at some point it might all be in a printout in an affidavit somewhere in a nice neat printout not like the screenshots of all the affidavits I get that are just screenshot text bubbles I think it keeps people a bit more honest but in my experience people's anxiety and it has gone up majorly co-parents anxiety because of the text messaging and them coming in on Viber or Telegram or Facebook Messenger or you never know when you're going to get another message or where so it gets people hypervigilant and hyper aroused. And so we're trying to just limit how many places a person can contact you on to just the app to try to help the co-parents too to get their own anxiety levels manageable yeah. and not just harassed on multiple platforms. And we also looked at free apps because we wanted to, we thought we'd just give people a free app and we found one that we liked. However, we realised that when you, so that's one of the things that we also are sharing because a lot of people did, don't know because we didn't know that if you have to use free apps, obviously they share all your data with everyone. So we found out one of these was like a Russian shelf company and anyway, dodgy, and we made it really cheap. So it's only on a month to month basis. It's less than two coffees a month. If people don't like it, go back to WhatsApp, give it a go. They don't have to pay a year up front. And because for some families, $200 or $300 can be a lot to fork out for trying out an app that they might not like. So yeah, so we, the people who do the course get six months free of app use as well. And yeah, I guess everything we do is really about trying to resolve conflict for people, helping them co-parent better. So after mediation, making agreements in mediation, I think it's extremely useful. Um, uh, it, it resolves so much conflict, but I think there is, that that's one of the reasons I wanted to do it. There is more to do often after than just that. And when people do these programs and they use apps and they get support, and of course, in session, we talk about what kind of support do you need? It might be also other things. I think it's really important to set people up for success. Mediation can be sometimes a really great experience for people, sometimes not so much, right, depending on what they've gone through. So how can we support people after that is something that I think is really important. Just if I could um, say so one last thing serious. and then I'll question. People often ask us, have you got something like the Tonometer, like our family well, wizard? And we did develop our moderator, which was a, for a similar purpose, but we've got it on hold at the moment because there's some research being done that the results aren't out yet that's pointing to the fact that those sorts of tonometer stuff on apps can actually be used as instruments instruments of coercive control and make situations worse. So we've pressed the pause button. We've taken that off our app. If the research comes out and says, no, that it's okay, then it will be reappearing back on our app. But um, at the moment, we just until the, the jury's out on that, so we didn't want to, to yeah. provide anything that might be harmful to people. No, and, and we just, um, and I guess that's the one thing is we really want, we, we're here, if you guys use it or your clients use it, please give us feedback. We're here to change things. We have the support emails actually get responded to because I tried lots of apps and courses and a lot of the support emails does, don't get responded to. I had, a, I know it's almost out of time, Rana, because you're appearing, but <laughs> I, Sandra said, how is the app viewed by the courts in relation to restraining orders, et cetera? It's a really good question. Actually, we did talk to the judiciary here but it's not something actually that they mentioned. So I can, uh, we can go and Sorry, find what was that question? I missed it. How was the... How was the app viewed by the courts in relation to restraining orders? Because obviously with a restraining order, you can't like directly communicate with someone. Is the, I guess the question, Cassandra, is the question, are you allowed to, obviously you can write it into the restraining order if you want, <clears throat> but so is it is it that you, can you maybe ask the question so I can have a bit more context about around it? Are you still here? I don't know if Cassandra is still here. Yeah, no. she's still here. Oh. Okay, she might be gone. I have a cup of coffee. So, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what the question is about, but I would imagine that. Oh, it's, it's if there was a. Oh, she's answered. <laughs> Sorry, it's there. It's a co parent when a training order is in place. It would be an option. I think it's always an option if you want to, you, you can, you can ask the court to put it in the restraining order because often there's communication clauses in a restraining order, right? That says you can communicate by text message for the kids only. So I would imagine you can do the app. Otherwise, I would think you breach a final restraining order if you communicate with someone directly through an app. Uh, so I do think it would have to be written into duty or uh, be requested to put in there. But maybe we can ask the course to say if you use an app. Okay. Exempt yeah. family mediation and stuff, maybe it could be an exemption in the future. Who knows? 
Yeah, I, I think that in the restraining orders that I've seen, I haven't paid a lot of attention to them, but I think there's usually, if you're still co-parenting, there's uh, prescriptive things written in. Of yeah, you, if there is, yes. But, so, it, has be, but it has to be written in. It can't be an automatic, let's communicate through an app. In the then, United yeah. States, when you apply for the family court, no matter what's for, you automatically have to use a co-parenting app of some kind. And I think that Australia is probably going to go down that path because they do clear up a lot of the ambiguities of text messaging. Yeah. Right. Well, I would like to thank you both for um, being here today. It's been really informative, just getting right. some more information about how to mediate. And, yeah, the app looks really good. And there was a bit of feedback here. Dee, I think, who's left, has said thank you for the information. Yeah, uh, informative ses session, ladies. Congratulations on new program and app. So much thought has gone into both these initiatives. Yeah, it definitely has. Like I said, if anyone has any questions, please email just admin at the Co-Parenting Institute or support at the Co-Parenting Institute. We'd love to know your thoughts. And if there's anyone who wants to connect with us to talk about getting in, in, in the East Coast, we would be really interested in that because that would be really awesome. The more people we can help, the better it is. And I've put the um, link to the website in the um, chat box as well. Cool. Thank you so much for having us, Rana. And That's all right. Thanks, everyone.